Good morning, dear students. Um, this is week four of the Introduction to Cultural Studies, and uh, today we'll do something slightly different. That is, we'll do a bit of recycling. Uh, when this course uh, was uh, recorded uh, last year, or two years ago actually, during the pandemic, uh, it um, only had 15 hours, so some of the uh, topics that we are going to discuss uh, uh, now in the 30-hour course uh, were omitted and some of them were rearranged. And uh, actually this week um, I was going to talk about uh, some more aspects of material cu culture and especially the everyday objects. Uh, so uh, clothing and costume and then food from the cultural studies perspective. And because these two topics were already recorded and um, it's just two parts, roughly 45 minutes each, um, I decided to just rearrange them and uh, use them for this year's course. So uh, what you are going to, uh, to see in a moment uh, is the 2020 edition of the lecture uh, with just exactly the same as I would tell you now, uh, the same slides, uh, but uh, in the short version of the lecture series, it would be spread over two weeks and now you'll get it in one week. Uh, there are uh, quizzes uh, accompanying these two parts uh, on, on Moodle, so if you'd like that, uh, you can take those quizzes. And uh, see you next time. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is week five of the Introduction to Culture Studies. And uh, today I'd like to talk with you about a specific aspect of material culture, that is the clothes. Uh, clothes are everyday objects, but they um, include a lot of cultural information and a lot of um, symbolism, and this is something I'd like to draw your attention to today. Uh, before we do that, two terms that will be important, the diachronic analysis and the synchronic analysis. The diachronic analysis is the analysis of something like language, culture or some aspect of culture, this time it's clothes, over a period of time. So diachronic is over a period of time. Synchronic analysis, and here we have the example of uh, foods, uh, is the analysis of something, again some aspect of culture, in different geographical locations. So for example in different social groups, in different uh, countries, like here we have two maps showing the food of the British Isles and the food of Italy. So synchronic analysis is the same time but different place. The diachronic analysis is usually the same place but different time. And uh, this time of course we are going to talk about uh, the diachronic analysis of uh, clothes, mostly in, in, uh, in Britain, let's say uh, more generally in the Western culture. So that's, uh, that's basically uh, the two words that I would like you to, uh, to remember. Clothing is a very important aspect of material culture because um, of its nature. Uh, it has what you might call an intimate quality, they lie next to the skin and inhabit the spaces of private life. Everybody wears clothes. Uh, they choose the clothes they like, they choose the clothes um, according to many aspects of, uh, of um, daily activities, the season of the year, the weather uh, and um, personal taste but also clothes are the embodiment of the self, uh, of the individual identity 
and group identity. That is why you have here some examples like a um, designer dress from a, uh, from a um, high fashion. So this is the couture, high couture. Uh, we have casual daily clothes here worn by a man because this is not an entirely female phenomenon. Uh, although perhaps statistically more women than men are interested in the uh, in the uh, novelties of fashion, but everybody wears clothes. And here we have the photograph of two nuns wearing two different types of habits. That is um, a specific example of what you might call professional clothes or clothes that uh, uh, that uh, embody the position, profession, social rank of the wearer. Uh, we might want to start uh, with the beginning as uh, we did uh, um, with culture in general, so why people started wearing clothes. We have two ideas, two hypotheses here that more or less correspond to two words in the English language, clothing and costume. Clothing refers to material conditions, textile production, what fabrics were available, um, what technologies were available, let's say weaving, was it, uh, was it known, uh, what uh, um, climate was there, so uh, did the clothes need to protect the, uh, the wearer uh, from cold or maybe from too much sunlight or perhaps uh, from the rain. Uh, so this all refers to the clothing aspect of, uh, of um, garments and costume refers more to the psychological needs. So religious beliefs, the belief in magic, magical protection, uh, social position and also personal um, aspects such as personal taste and the will to please, to be, uh, to be uh, presented as, uh, as an attractive person. So um, which one was first? We do not know. Uh, archaeology uh, suggests that uh, humans started wearing some kind of clothes very early on. Uh, so definitely uh, when they migrated from Africa, they started wearing some kind of clothes for protection against the colder climate uh, in other areas of the world. But um, many cultures have some stories about how people started wearing clothes and the uh, Western culture, the, the European culture, uh, would have this story in the Bible. So we have the story of Adam and Eve, how they ate the forbidden fruit and they realized that they were naked. So they started feeling ashamed of their nakedness and they took some leaves uh, from a, a nearby tree and covered their genitals, not because they were cold, but because they were ashamed for the first time of their nakedness. So they would be thinking about, uh, let's say, psychological needs rather than the, uh, the material conditions. Which one was first, we will really never know. Uh, if we think of um, uh, archaeology and uh, ethnography studying some uh, some uh, uh, let's say tribal cultures the, the cultures that haven't changed for many centuries or many millennia we have things like um, body painting really that might uh, have existed even before the um, the popularization of clothes of garments so it could be uh, used for practical reasons as a, as a kind of coverage of the body but also for psychological reasons for example as magical protection for the hunters for the warriors so uh, we have a lot of symbolic meanings embedded in clothes um, 
So beside this uh, body painting and adornment that could have symbolic meanings, we have symbolic meaning in every kind of clothes, including the clothes that you are wearing today. You may want to think about the symbolic meanings embedded in the clothes that you are actually wearing now. Why did you choose these particular clothes? Because they are comfortable? Because um, you're not going anywhere? Or perhaps you are going somewhere and you want to look in a particular way. So uh, what these symbols could mean? They could mean things like identification with heroes or totemic animals. This is quite frequent in tribal societies. The position of leadership to inspire fear and obedience in other members of the group. So here we have this uh, photograph of an Indian chief wearing uh, a very characteristic Native American uh, feather headdress. Um, so for, for the warriors this could give military advantage but also magical protection. The uniforms serve a symbolic meaning of identifying who is in your group and who is the enemy. Uh, sometimes clothes uh, denote political convictions. In the time of the French Revolution, you may recall the term the sans-culotte. In the Polish language, it's sans-culotte. The culotte were types of breeches, types of legwear that were popular among the aristocracy and upper classes of the French society before the revolution. The uh, common people, the peasants and uh, uh, poorer sections of the society, they normally wore trousers, not the culotte. So after the French Revolution, if you continued wearing culottes rather than trousers, this might suggest that you supported the aristocracy and might even get you guillotined. In China, after the communist revolution, one of the things uh, that the regime of Mao did was to introduce some kind of uniformed clothes for the people. So they would, uh, they would uh, look similar. It's a very egalitarian idea to make people look similar. Um, religious beliefs can be expressed through clothes. If you think, for example, about uh, uh, Islam and the way that uh, uh, religious convictions are expressed through clothes, mostly through women's clothes. Social rank. It could be high, for example, all kinds of professional uh, uniforms of doctors and scientists and judges. Here we have a um, photograph showing English judges wearing very formalized traditional clothes with wigs or low social rank like here we have a carnival version of a prison uniform. But prison uniforms were introduced to, to denote a low social rank in the prison. Also, the will to enhance bodily beauty and the will to please, but it is always influenced by the current ideal of what is beautiful, what is elegant and even what is natural. So uh, we, have, uh, we have the development of, uh, of clothes uh, over time. So basically, uh, the historians of uh, clothing um, denote three phases in the development of clothes. The first one goes from antiquity to the 14th century, so the uh, high middle ages, let's say, uh, perhaps the beginning of, of the Renaissance. There are not many changes, no national character, it's more or less similar for all social groups. It's uh, rarely tailored, usually long and draped. There would be, of course, the ways to differentiate, let's say, um, the wealth, but it would be more concerned with the quality of fabrics and, uh, uh, let's say, some accessories like jewellery or expensive uh, materials such as fur 
rather than, uh, than in the shape of the clothes. Then from the 14th century to the 19th century we have the second phase here identified, uh, illustrated by a, uh, by a picture showing two noble people from around the 18th century wearing, uh, as you can see, um, wigs, powdered wigs and uh, very expensive clothes made of expensive fabrics, perhaps silks, with embroidery sometimes in, uh, in uh, um, gold or silver thread. There is more individual and national character. We have the beginnings of fashion, so the changes that are followed by uh, rich people basically to express their wealth. Uh, there is more concern with economy and politics and less with religion. Increasingly, um, when the Middle Ages um, finish and we have the Renaissance and then, uh, then uh, the Enlightenment, uh, religious um, beliefs are not so uh, obviously expressed by, uh, by the European clothing. It's more with economy or politics, like which social class you belong to, rather than anything else. From the 19th century until today, the clothes are less individualized because we have the mass production, so people usually buy clothes than have them made to measure. Uh, we have international fashions, globalized culture, mechanical production and uh, the European expansion mostly propagated through the colonialism. Um, so most people in the world wear clothes resembling the fashionable clothes of the Western culture. Uh, so, as you can see, um, quite a lot uh, can happen over time. And now I would like to give you some examples. Um, it's the cat. Uh, from the 19th century, I'm mostly um, interested in my uh, uh, research in the 19th century. So, this is perhaps the most obvious thing to me uh, to give you examples from the 19th century. So, let's look at two examples of uh, the clothes from the first half of the 18th century, from, of the 19th century, from the classicism and romanticism period. Classicism or neoclassicism. This is the uh, first style in the 19th century. This is the style of Napoleon and Jane Austen. And uh, here you have uh, an illustration from a fashion magazine um, from this period and you can see uh, it all symbolizes the values that were most popular and highly praised in this period. Simplicity, it has this kind of heroic um, attitude associated with uh, the ancient Greece and Rome. Uh, the whole structure of the dress resembles a drapery wrapped around a column. So kind of flowing, loose material following the natural shape of the body. Um, light colors, little decoration, simple hairstyles. They denote youth, health, morality and heroism basically, symbolically. Then after the fall of Napoleon until more, more or less the time of Queen Victoria's succession in 1837, we have the period that could be called Romanticism. And if you even look at the illustration, it denotes something completely opposite to Classicism. So imagination rather than simplicity, peacefulness, rather than anything, let's say, heroic or military. Individualism. There is a lot of space for individual taste, individual expression. Rich colors rather than light and white um, dresses. The hourglass shape with very pronounced shoulders, waist and hips rather than this kind of flowing drapery and column-like shape. A lot of ornaments, 
Everything is elaborate, including the hairstyles. Just compare this very elaborate hairdo from the classical period and the romantic period. So it all denotes joyfulness, refinement, uh, rather than, let's say, simplicity and health. It's very well expressed in fashion uh, and it very well corresponds to the political situation after the French Revolution, during the Napoleonic Wars and then after the fall of Napoleon and the triumph of the middle class in the, uh, in the 1820s and 30s. Then we have another example of the crinoline the quintessential high Victorian fashion. So this construction supporting the skirt, very full skirt from below. Uh, if you look at the shape of the crinoline dresses, they look like bird cages. They weren't as stiff as bird cages, of course. They look like um, some elements of, uh, of garden architecture, like the glass house structure, really. So, um, and this is the embodiment of Victorian values. Really, this is probably the most expressive Victorian style denoting Victorian values, such as traditionalism, very strictly defined gender roles. So we have this very traditional feminine shape with enlarged hips, uh, small waist and big skirt. But it is achieved through modern technology. Before that, in the first years of Victoria's reign, a very similar shape was fashionable, but to achieve it, a woman had to wear many layers of undergarments. Now she could reduce the number of undergarments by using this new invention, the metal and fabric frame to support the skirt. It was more comfortable and uh, it was probably the first fashion that was mass produced. Those crinoline cages or crinoline frames were mass produced so this was becoming more available to the middle class and more democratic. Uh, so as you can see, especially from the historical perspective, we can see a lot of uh, symbolism, cultural symbolism and the embodiment of cultural values expressed through clothes. If you remember our initial discussion on the uh, characteristics of culture. Culture is all-encompassing. So you will have the same uh, ideas expressed through painting and architecture and literature and everyday objects like clothes. And while these clothes are fashionable, uh, they are basically taken for granted. Uh, there is this idea of the transparency of fashion. So when something is fashionable, people think it reveals and strengthens the natural beauty of the wearer, which is especially visible if you look at those uh, ridiculous and exaggerated fashions from the 19th century like the bustle style or the tournure, this is the, the synonym style of the, of the late Victorian period. So here we have an, element, uh, uh, an illustration from 1883 with a grown woman and a girl. This is a child dressed up in a very similar uh, fashion as her mother. Probably this is a young teenager accompanying the mother on some social occasions. And what we, uh, what we can observe is the same fashion, the same shape, the same use of the artificial dress improver, so the elements of underwear that would shape the silhouette. Uh, so it was worn by everyone, including the occasions in which children were um, dressed up in more formal clothes. We can see a, a woman on the photograph, in the center photograph, wearing a crinoline dress in 1860, although it does not really suit her figure. 
uh, everybody wore the clothes when they were fashionable. So even if you were not a fashion model by your looks, you would wear these things because they were fashionable and so they were thought to be elegant, to be ladylike and to reveal natural beauty, to really, um, well, to be socially acceptable, you had to do it. So here we have a, a rather short and plump lady still wearing a crinoline that makes her look even shorter and even plumper. Uh, the last one is uh, the romantic fashion and we can see a portrait uh, of uh, a lady who's not very young but still she's wearing this very elaborate, very decorative uh, collar and cap with a lot of uh, um, ribbons and uh, frills and decorations. Um, why? Because it was believed in the 1830s that it makes her look respectable. It makes her look appropriate. So um, the last thing uh, in this part is this little graph showing the changes in male fashion because as I say fashion is not only for women. So before the revolution and after the revolution. Before the revolution we have the traditional 18th century court dress with a wig, with uh, silk and velvet fabrics, with embroidery and lace and uh, the culottes, those uh, short knee breeches and high heels and this is all believed to make a man look more manly, to emphasize his wealth, to em emphasize his uh, sophistication and um, the fact that he is educated and cultured and that he is a nobleman. After the revolution, the same values of being masculine, of being sophisticated and educated and cultured are expressed through completely different clothes. So no wig, you have a hat rather. Um, woolen fabrics in dark color rather than uh, than um, embroidered silks, uh, no accessories, very limited um, amount of accessories and jewellery, uh, trousers and boots rather than culottes and high heel shoes and this all is meant to express the same values but the culture changed. So the values let's say of what makes a man masculine, strong and attractive are completely changed. And the last thing here is uh, um, another principle called Laver's Law. After uh, James Laver, uh, uh, one of the first fashion historians, uh, in his uh, very important book called Taste and Fashion, he put on this uh, table uh, which shows the way that the same costume is treated over time. So when it is fashionable, it is considered smart, elegant. This is just the moment to wear it. Before, it is daring. A few years earlier, it is shameless. Even more, uh, before it is uh, fashionable, it is indecent. So, on first only very brave and uh, um, usually young and independent-minded wearers would wear it. But like 10 years before, nobody would even think of wearing something so indecent. Um, then it's fashionable and smart and elegant and then gradually over quite um, a short period of time it becomes criticized first as dowdy so let's say um, a bit outdated you could still wear it if you weren't uh, uh, going for a very important formal occasion if you weren't very rich, if you weren't very young, you might still wear it but if you are like 
at the forefront of fashion you would not. Then 10 years after it was fashionable, it is hideous, it is horrible. This is the moment when most clothes get thrown away. That is why not many historical clothes survive. Because 10 to 15 years after they are fashionable, they are considered completely hopeless and absolutely ugly. And most women, especially rich women who can buy new clothes um, more uh, frequently, they just throw away or give away those old rags they don't want to see anymore. And then gradually, the appreciation of fashion, of the same dress, uh, goes back. First, it's kind of ridiculous. So you might wear it ironically. Then it's amusing. So it, as you can see, it's less negative. Then it's kind of quaint. It's kind of curious and funny. And uh, uh, then the next generation would find it and start wearing it as a as a kind of joke perhaps first, but then it's charming and then it's romantic. And even later, it's beautiful again, but as a kind of historical piece. So um, it could be reappreciated fully as a, uh, as a thing relating to history. Let me continue in a moment. And now let's talk a little bit about contemporary clothes, so not really the historical perspective, but contemporary clothes and what kind of symbolic values can be deduced from contemporary clothes. So, for example, here we have on the slide different versions of clothes related to religious belief. We have different, um, different types of uh, uh, Islamic headwear for women, so the hijab and the niqab and the burqa, so uh, you can see the difference. But also some less obvious clothes inspired by religious belief, like a burkini, so a cross between a burqa and a bikini. So um, the costume for uh, swimming and sea bathing for Muslim women. If you think that religious convictions are expressed only in Islam, you're very wrong. Here we have an Orthodox Jewish family wearing very characteristic clothes, but this time it's more characteristic in the men's wear rather than the women's wear. Uh, there are some things that uh, women, uh, Jewish women wear um, to mark their uh, religious um, uh, belonging, um, it's, it's basically modest clothes and covering your uh, hair or wearing a wig sometimes. But in case of traditional Orthodox Jews, it's more visible in men's clothes. If you think that Christianity doesn't have that, think again. If you go to Italy in summer, in many churches, you can find such um, notices that you need to be properly dressed so not to reveal too much skin to be able to see the inside of a church even as a tourist so um, these things are not really historical evidence they are still going uh, going on uh, if we talk about the English culture and fashion, we can talk about, well, the characteristics of the English fashion. And here I'm actually taking this from a, uh, from a book by Kate Fox, Watching the English. I uploaded the book, uh, the ebook to uh, Moodle. So if you want to read more, this is a very interesting book uh, to read. It's not only about fashion, it's about generally um, typical social behavior of English people. The uh, clothes, the foods, the social customs. Um, but uh, what can you find, uh, um, what would be the characteristics of English fashion, at least traditionally understood? So first of all, eccentricity, creativity, informality and irony. You have some uh, fame, 
famous clothing designers like Vivian Westwood or Alexander McQueen and if you look at their clothes, their collections, they are all about eccentricity and creativity. They are very um, fanciful and sometimes shocking. And this is connected with a very strong subcultures in 20th century British culture. So we have this kind of collective distinctiveness of some groups like punks, for example, uh, who would distinguish themselves from other groups, mostly by clothes. If you look at some um, uh, famous occasions like the Ascot races where women come wearing very elaborate and extravagant hats. This is part of English culture and even if you look at the clothes worn by the Queen herself, it's very informal, it's very um, ironic sometimes. She looks like this, uh, let's say, uh, country lady, especially that she likes uh, or she liked when she was younger all kinds of outdoor pursuits like horse riding. She was a horse breeder all her life, so there you go. Uh, we have the concept of the regional or national dress and you have two examples here. One is the Highland dress, the traditional costume of men in Scotland with some typical uh, elements. So you can see these elements here. The most typical is of course the kilt, so the lower part of the costume which resembles a skirt. It's not a skirt, it's a tailored gar garment traditional Scottish garment called a kilt. Uh, perhaps even a, sp uh, a sporan is also a, quite a well-known element. This is this, uh, this uh, bag, decorative bag worn uh, at the front of the kilt, mostly because traditionally they do not wear underwear beneath it, so they really don't want the wind to lift up the front of the kilt, so they used sporan to keep it in place. Uh, the other image is um, another tradition, a regional tradition in London, going back to the late 19th century, uh, the so-called pearly king and queen. So here we have two people dressed up in this fashion uh, for some formal occasions, uh, working class people, especially those who are involved in tailoring, in production of the clothes and production of uh, pearl buttons that were very fashionable uh, at some points in the in the 19th century. They started uh, using like the, the spare buttons or, or some uh, extra buttons to decorate their clothes and uh, this is uh, 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 still quite a popular working class tradition in London so it's not only the rich who had regional dress uh, two more slides. One is um, the costumes used in films. How do you choose a costume for a film character? Especially if you want to do costume drama. So uh, here we have two examples uh, from uh, very successful films and uh, TV series. Downton Abbey. So we have one of the daughters of the family wearing this rather exotic looking costume at the beginning of the 20th century uh, with some loose pants and uh, another from the film Django Unchained, this kind of late 19th century um, fantasy about the black superhero. Uh, and as you can see, he's wearing the, um, the sunglasses and this shape of sunglasses was absolutely unknown in the 19th century. So uh, this could be ironic, this could be um, symbolic to, uh, to denote um, uh, that this character doesn't really fit, I would say, psychologically his time frame. Uh, but uh, what you normally have to consider is what was available in the period and what would the character choose to wear. So like this uh, character from Downton Abbey, she is the youngest and most independent and rebellious daughter of the family. So the moment that this costume with pants became available, she would have it. She was rich and she wanted to shock. So this is what she would have. Uh, the last thing is what I call the morality of clothes. So 
let's say the uh, aspects connected with clothing that point to um, uh, to moral and social issues and here we have three things to consider one is uh, this costume for a little girl that's uh, quite sexualized so does fashion uh, sexualize little girls does it make them look like women before they are physically grown uh, sometimes it does is this a problem what can we do about it? What should we do about it? The other problem is the counterfeit fashions. The um, uh, fake logos. So uh, not Adidas, but as you can see Adidos or Abibas or other similar names that do not uh, fully um, follow the, um, the the logo of a popular producer but they uh, they are similar enough so that people can be um, lured by the lower price or kind of cheated into buying these clothes when they want to have um, the original fashions uh, this is definitely a legal problem. Is this a moral pro problem as well? What do you think of counterfeit fashions? Should the police be more decisive in uh, fighting that? And the last thing is um, this image of a young woman from probably one of the Asian countries like Bangladesh or Pakistan, which are now uh, very uh, active in clothes production and uh, this is from one of the social campaigns uh, the uh, caption reads I'm the real fashion victim so we have slave labor sometimes uh, slave labor of children and very young people um, who are also the addressees of many of the fashions in the West so uh, this uh, quite miserable and poor looking young woman from probably one of those uh, uh, those places where slave labor is used to produce cheap um, poor quality but cheap uh, fashionable clothes uh, is really the victim not because like the some of the um, fashionistas in the in the west she just follows the changes of the of the styles very closely and feels compelled to buy new clothes every uh, every so often but because she really suffers the injustice and abuse of the fashion industry so that's it uh, you'll have the uh, the quiz uh, as well I know who made the quiz. You'll have to make them in the end. I know how many and I know the exact list of people who are watching the, um, the films and doing the quizzes. And uh, you don't have to do it, but then I don't have to give you the credit for the course. So um, we are all grown ups. Do what you should do. Uh, it will be much easier for you to um, uh, to pass the final test and to get a good mark in the end and next week we'll talk about the food thank you good morning ladies and gentlemen this is week six of the introduction to culture studies and today we continue our discussion of everyday objects and material culture and we will talk about food. Um, just to remind you, um, these are two slides from the, uh, from the previous week, just to, uh, to remind you about the diachronic and synchronic analysis. So once again, diachronic is the analysis of some uh, aspect of culture over a period of time. This was basically what I used for the analysis of clothes last week. And the synchronic analysis is the analysis of something in 
different geographical locations or different social groups in one location. And this is basically the approach I would like to, um, to show you on the example of food. And uh, food, of course, refers to a very universal biological need. Eating food fulfills a basic biological um, necessity, not only for humans, but for all living organisms. But uh, of course, in case of humans, there is a lot of culture involved on top of nature uh, and uh, when it's culture uh, we can have uh, uh, food studies so we can have the study of culture so where there is food we can have food studies um, because different people and different cultures eat different foods and there are very many uh, various factors that influence that of course some factors um, are more or less natural, like the uh, availability of different foodstuffs, the climate, the agriculture, the trade con uh, contact. So you can see the climate is natural, but uh, the mode of agriculture and trade are not. These are cultural, uh, cultural uh, factors. Then we have some culture specific ingredients or techniques or dishes like let's say in uh, um, the Far East, uh, rice is uh, the most popular food, not only because this is available in the climate there, but also there is a lot of culture involved. Here we have um, an image uh, of, uh, of uh, a sushi dish uh, from Japanese culture, so a very specific way to eat rice. There are religious food laws and taboos, so some cultures do not eat certain foods and also uh, in most cultures foods or specific dishes are connected, for example, with religious celebrations and uh, holidays. So here we have uh, a typical American Christmas dinner with a turkey, with a roast turkey. Uh, of course, uh, there is a connection between food and medicine, so medical dietary concerns. We have the connection between, between food and social class. We'll talk about it uh, in a little moment. We also have fashions. We have globalization. So perhaps this, uh, this um, bucket of popcorn is, uh, is the embodiment of that, but also the way that popcorn has been associated with um, the cinema, with uh, watching some shows or, or, or spectacles. This is, this is a cultural association. There is nothing really in popcorn to make it a, um, a food that you, watch while, uh, that you eat while watching films. Why did it happen? So, uh, of course, we can go back um, to the very beginning of culture and civilization. So, the transition from the hunter-gatherer culture to agriculture. Those of you um, who, uh, who watched uh, or read uh, Professor Harari's uh, um, book or, or lectures, uh, no, already he talks a lot about the transition from hunter-gatherer culture to agriculture. He thinks there were some dark sides to it. Um, probably there were. Well, one of the things is that apparently the health of the agricultural societies declined uh, if compared with, uh, with hunter-gatherer societies. So um, there were... Uh, probably more people born, uh, but uh, the health of individuals was not really uh, was not really improved by the transition to to agriculture. Um, we might go on. I don't really want to uh, spend too much time discussing that because you can easily find it in the book or lecture uh, series um, on uh, on uh, sapiens. 
Uh, what I would like to uh, draw your attention to is uh, English culture and Eng English cuisine. So something that is the focus of study in the English Institute, of course. And uh, there, has been, there have been a lot of uh, stereotypes regarding English cuisine. Um, probably the most uh, famous or notorious of them is that, to quote from a very famous book by uh, uh, a satirist and culture historian, uh, George Mikesh, uh, on the continent people have good food, in England they have good table manners. Of course, good table manners because the food is not so great. Uh, so um, there is, um, or the, the, there was at least, um, for a very long time, a stereotype that uh, English food is not very tasty, not very sophisticated. Uh, it started to change uh, at the turn of the 21st century, mostly through the popularity of celebrity chefs and um, uh, cookery programs on TV, so people like Nigella Lawson and, um, and uh, Jamie Oliver, uh, who made cooking uh, fun, who made cooking interesting, who made cooking sexy. Uh, this was uh, against the long-standing stereotype that uh, English cuisine is drab and tasteless, something probably most, um, uh, most uh, um, associated with, uh, let's say, the kind of food you can find in TV dinners, a rather notorious, uh, I would say, um, type of, uh, of ready-made uh, or prefabricated food that you could buy in, uh, in Britain in supermarkets, something to just heat up and eat in front of the TV set. Uh, so, um, usually a kind of standard meat and two veg, this is a kind of typical British way. Uh, another stereotype is of course the stereotype of tea drinking. We'll talk about it in a little while, uh, some more, but uh, apparently the British like to put milk in their tea and there's been a whole discussion whether you should put milk or tea first and the difference in this order is very much class related. It, uh, it actually goes back to the 18th century when um, good quality china was very expensive and uh, if you had a poorer quality uh, teacup you might want to pour milk first because milk was cold and then hot tea rather than to risk cracking your teapot. Uh, or tea um, uh, teacup uh, with uh, the hot liquid going first and only then diluted with a with a colder uh, with a colder liquid. So, but now um, I guess uh, the modern uh, mugs and cups are not that uh, not that fragile. So uh, as you can see, a lot can happen, and uh, uh, we will uh, we will talk about it in a in a little while. Uh, but first, perhaps just to demonstrate that diachronic study of English cuisine is absolutely possible, because uh, we can observe uh, the differences over time happening in British. Uh, food culture, let's put it. So here you have um, a slide packed with information, so um, perhaps it's a good idea to to stop and read it or uh, perhaps to go uh, to Moodle and see this slide again. Uh, so uh, you have the diachronic development from the Celtic times uh, through Roman, Medieval, Tudor, Stuart, Georgian, Victorian. So all these developments that we talked about in the context of high art are just uh, as um, valid in the context of daily life and everyday objects. And in each of these periods you have new foodstuff appearing so from a very basic diet in Celtic times, so consisting of uh, wild animals that could be hunted, fish and shellfish, 
leafy vegetables, berries, nuts, honey and grains to be made into some simple breads or porridge, we have more and more sophisticated foods coming. First with the Romans, things like wine and olive oil and many kinds of fruits and vegetables and herbs. Um, then we have uh, fashions really, like the great fashion for sweet foods that starts in the medieval cuisine and then continues until today. Uh, the British are uh, really great consumers of sweets, um, which is not very healthy for them, but that's part of the of the culture so chocolate well chocolate really first starts to uh, to be known in uh, in britain during the stuart period so in the 17th century and uh, it was not really known in the modern form they they never added milk to their chocolate yet um only uh, only later so um we have uh, the great popularization of tea and coffee during the Georgian period, so the, um, the 18th century. Also uh, potatoes, they were known before, of course they come from the New World, so they were not known before the discovery of America, but uh, it's only in the 18th century when potatoes become so important for the um, cuisine of the British Isles, which will lead to, this, to disaster in the 19th century during the potato famine in, uh, in Ireland when there was a uh, disease of the crops that actually uh, killed most of the plants and uh, poor farmers in Ireland were left destitute and hungry. Um, in the 19th century, we have really what uh, gave rise to all those stereotypes. The fact that presentation was more important than, uh, than the food itself. But we have um, the beginning of uh, popular cookery books and first commercial brands. So a lot of things that, uh, that are still popular now. And uh, of course, uh, in the 20th century, it all uh, increases through um, the invention of refrigeration and convenience foods and also uh, food fads. So passing fashions like the great fashion for Mediterranean cuisine starting in the 1950s. This all really affects culture over time. So it's not only uh, it's not only the synchronic analysis, but diachronic analysis is just as possible. Uh, let us look at some examples of food-related customs in Britain from the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. So let's say the 18th century, the most important uh, advancement is the beginning of tea culture. So all this traditionally English. Uh, um, tea drinking really starts in the 18th century when the trade relations with, uh, with the Far East, uh, with uh, China especially, um, grow. Uh, so the uh, import of tea leaves and the China, the crockery, uh, really affects the culture. Uh, people start organizing tea parties, visiting, visiting at home, which encourages um, politeness and good manners. Yes, these good table manners really start in the 18th century. But also things like um, greater attention paid to interior decoration, because if you had fashionable friends for tea, you would like to show a fashionable home. Then in the 19th century, we have um, the uh, the beginning of one of the um, traditional national foods of England, that is fish and chips. It really starts in the 19th century with the development of the railways, because this is um, street food. This is Victorian street food, some kind of dish that people did not eat at home, displaying all those great table manners, but something they could eat on the go. So it was either working people's uh, food in the cities, those who didn't have 
lunch break so they would buy something and eat on the go or it was the food eaten by travelers on the railway stations and in the railway. Uh, so it is connected with of course the development of railways, also um, the urban lifestyle and uh, seaside holidays when the middle class start to go for holidays to the seaside by railway. They um, eat more fish, of course, because it's fresh at the seaside. They want to um, prolong this feeling of uh, freedom and pleasure um, to their daily life. And many cities start selling fish and chips, usually wrapped in a newspaper, in an old newspaper. Victorian culture was very green, as we might say. They recycled everything, um, not because they had any knowledge of ecology, but because they were very economical with money. So uh, this is how fish and chips became a national dish, or one of the national dishes, or the original national dish, let's put it this way. Then in the 20th century, during wartime, we have food rationing during and after the war. <clears throat> it actually ended as late as 1954. There were food shortages. Well, everybody remembered that Britain is an island and you can only grow as much food as, uh, as grows there. So important foodstuffs such as sugar, meat or bacon, cheese, fats such as butter or margarine, marmalade uh, and tea were rationed. You would get a ration uh, book and if you wanted to buy these stuff you would have to uh, present the, um, the tickets. A similar thing happened uh, in Poland during the communist regime. There were, there were food shortages and some important foods uh, like, uh, like meat or sugar, but never the tea, were rationed. So um, as you can see, a lot of culture can be deduced from foods. So much so that it's absolutely legitimate to talk about food studies as a branch of culture studies. Uh, speaking of national dishes, there are of course regional variations. So let's look at some popular foods in, uh, in Britain. So things like full English breakfast, does famous fry-up with a lot of fried foods, fried eggs, fried mushrooms, fried sausages, fried tomatoes, fried breads, um, constituting a very substantial breakfast, something that uh, was meant to be eaten uh, um, as the first meal in the day, usually not very early in the morning. This was a rich man's, this was a gentleman's uh, uh, breakfast, but it was supposed to keep them going until dinner, until late dinner. Uh, or things like Sunday roast, quintessential pub food. Uh, still, if you go to Britain uh, and uh, there is a Sunday, just look for the signs outside pubs that they serve Sunday roast. So roast meat, that was quite difficult to make at home from the 19th century onwards when everybody started to cook with um, coal um, stoves rather than open fire with all the uh, with all the extra little dishes like Yorkshire pudding and sauces and uh, roast vegetables and such. So you can still go to a pub. It's a very popular, I would say, social institution in Britain. Um, there are regional variations like uh, Scottish uh, cuisine, which is somewhat different. It's actually poorer. Scotland has long been a poorer um, sister to England in the United Kingdom. Uh, so they developed their own cuisine using, for example, um, cheaper cuts of meat or organ meat for uh, dishes like haggis. Uh, they had their own celebrations, like Burns' Night, which is uh, a celebration in honour of, uh, of Scotland's uh, greatest poet, uh, Robert Burns. Um, so, 
in the middle of winter, it's August 26th uh, of January, they have this uh, wonderful patriotic celebration when they uh, eat haggis and mashed potatoes and mashed turnips, so the nips and tatties as they call them. Uh, they play bagpipes, they drink whiskey and they recite uh, Scottish poetry. But um, uh, the fourth uh, image here is quite interesting because uh, why would it be here? Uh, actually, uh, in many opinion polls among the British, like what is the national, the current national uh, dish of, uh, of the United Kingdom? Uh, the one that came first was this, chicken tikka masala, an Indian dish. Actually, an Indian dish which is not known in India. It was introduced uh, during the, uh, the period of colonialism in the 19th century uh, by Hindu uh, Indian cooks to cook for the British colonial administrators. And when the administrators retired, um, back to England, uh, they very often took some of their servants with them and especially the cooks because they liked uh, the Indian cuisine much better than the English cuisine. More spices, more um, distinct flavors and uh, especially uh, the foods like chicken tikka masala really started to be, uh, to be popular and uh, now of course, also with uh, uh, a lot of immigration from the former colonies, uh, from India, from Pakistan, um, you have a lot of um, Indian and Pakistani people living in Britain, well, usually not the first generation uh, of uh, former colonial subjects and their foods uh, have been appreciated perhaps as a more tasty alternative to traditional British food. Uh, the next thing is um, associations between social class and specific dishes. And here I'll refer to the book I mentioned last week in the reference to fashion, Kate Fox is watching the English. And she gives a list of uh, all kinds of uh, strange or not so strange foods associated in England with lower class, with the poorer sections of the society. For example, brown cocktails, especially the sauce, the, the kind of Thousand Island sauce, this is low class. Eggs and chips if eaten together. If someone eats eggs without the chips, the chips, it means the, the french fries in, in America. Um, the uh, the chips that you know as American chips are called uh, crisps in England. So I'm using the English uh, way of, of calling these foods. But eggs and chips eaten together, this is working class. Pasta or rice salad, especially with sweet corn, kind of canned sweet corn uh, in it. Um, this is working class. Tinned food in syrup, working class or chip butties. You have the image here. Um, a very, very strange invention. Um, I confess I never tried it. Perhaps I will next time in Britain. A kind of sandwich with chips in it. So it's like carbs with carbs in carbs. Um, very carby dish. And uh, apparently this is quite popular among um, the working class and among the, the lower sections of the, of the British society. Also another thing. What do you call the evening meal? What's the last meal of the day? Um, there are three possibilities, dinner, tea or supper. And the exact usage of these words is um, also uh, dependent on the social class. So uh, let's say uh, the, the word tea is used among the working class and it's eaten around 6.30. For other classes, tea is a four o'clock light meal with tea being drunk, but uh, things like scones, cakes and sandwiches also being served. So it's not the last meal, it's this um, uh, four or sometimes five o'clock uh, drink with some snacks. Uh, the other way of uh, calling this last meal is dinner. This is the lower or middle middle class uh, meal eaten around seven o'clock. 
and the upper class or the upper middle class would call it a supper. So this is an informal family evening meal eaten around 7.30. As you can see, um, the higher the class, the later the last meal is eaten. Or a dinner, if the upper class use the word dinner, they mean a more formal meal eaten around 8.30, so even later. The one with guests, the one sometimes with the waiter service. Uh, so um, there is a lot of connection between the cuisine and social class. And we continue in a moment. Uh, so uh, the uh, last few slides uh, refer to other aspects of food and cuisine, mostly in English-speaking countries, but not exclusively. The first thing is the connection between food and medicine, so the diet. And uh, here you have some um, uh, covers of popular magazines uh, which refer to uh, very controversial issues of what food is healthy and what food is not. And um, as you can see, uh, we have uh, the great battle between some doctors who say that fat and cholesterol are dangerous and they cause heart disease and some doctors that believe that sugar is even more dangerous than fat, that fats are in fact good and, um, and it's sugar that, and, and uh, carbohydrates that are uh, dangerous, especially if eaten in excess, as in the modern, uh, in the modern um, diet mostly. I guess now the state of, of the medicine is that sugar is more dangerous than fats especially natural fats such as, uh, such as butter or, or olive oil. Uh, but um, as you can see, the controversy uh, is, still, uh, is still there. But the more recent uh, um, magazines actually point to the fact that you can eat butter but sugar kills. Uh, also, the uh, great popularity of um, organic food so naturally grown food, local food, and these are the ongoing discussions verging on um, medicine and uh, culture and uh, ecology. Uh, so a lot can be said about, um, about uh, food related issues in this respect. So from the uh, medical perspective, in medical discourse, you may remember uh, Michel Foucault and his uh, his uh, concept of the discourse. So the way of speaking, but especially the way of speaking affecting culture. Uh, we also have the slide with some uh, religious uh, um, um, things related to food and also special. Uh, occasion foods. So we have uh, uh, the stamps that are given on kosher food and halal food. Uh, so the foods that are uh, that are accepted and um, deemed uh, good by the Jewish religion and the Muslim religion. Um, there are a lot of similarities between the two concepts of kosher and halal, so uh, this is also an interesting thing, um, why we have two different ideas and what are the differences, if any. Uh, plus, below, uh, we have two, um, let's say, festive meals. One is a uh, um, Vietnamese uh, uh, dish. Um, consisting of rice and uh, I guess beans and meat cooked together in this kind of packet wrapped in uh, banana leaves mostly, uh, which is a traditional typical food eaten uh, during the uh, New Year celebrations. So in Vietnam all families basically gather around the table uh, they have a big reunion and they eat something like that 
I tried it, it's very good, but it's not very popular, of course, in, in Europe. Uh, however, there are local festive foods, like the great popularity of carp for a Christmas Eve dinner in Poland. Uh, it is connected, let's say, with Christianity and the celebration of Christmas, but each country has their own dishes, basically. Uh, this is um, uh, relative to history, to availability of different foodstuffs. The fact that in Poland the most important festivities are actually held the day or the night before Christmas rather than on Christmas Day. In the English-speaking countries, the most important uh, meal of Christmas is Christmas dinner with uh, roast turkey, usually, or, or some other uh, poultry. In Poland, it's the meatless um, dinner on Christmas Eve. This is the big family reunion, and what people mostly eat is fish and Probably the most popular fish for that is carp. Again, a long story, you might want to Google that, why it's carp and not, let's say, salmon. Um, but uh, again, it's quite, uh, quite interesting. Then we have uh, some uh, historical problems, sometimes quite serious problems, uh, uh, relating to food consumption, food and drink. So first of all, we have this uh, this image of an Indian soldier biting the off uh, the end of the bullet, and uh, the question is just what exactly is this bullet grease? And it refers to um, the Indian mutiny or the Indian revolution against the British colonists in 1857, so at the height of British colonization, when India was called um, the jewel in the crown, the Raj or, or whatever, uh, the army uh, mostly consisted of uh, native soldiers and English officers. And uh, when a new type of bullet was introduced, the soldiers, as you can see in the image, uh, had to bite off the end of the bullet to, uh, um, to insert it into the rifle. And the bullets were greased with something. Uh, for the officers, this was a completely trivial matter. They didn't really care what kind of grease it was. It was some sort of fat and that's it. But for the soldiers, this was absolutely no trivial matter. For the um, uh, soldiers who were Hinduists, uh, they were afraid this might be, uh, this might be beef fat. Uh, and uh, cows are sacred for Hindus, so they wouldn't eat beef. They wouldn't even want to touch beef fat with their lips. Uh, many of the soldiers were also Muslim, and they were afraid this was pork fat. And of course, pork is not halal. This is, this is uh, forbidden by, uh, by the Muslim religion. So again, for other reasons, because the pork in the Muslim religion is considered to be unclean. Uh, it's a taboo to touch um, pork fat. So when, the, so when the officers did not respond properly with enough attention and understanding to these problems, the soldiers um, rebelled and uh, a major revolution, very bloody and very cruel, started. Uh, which ev eventually led to the, the complete reorganization of the British colonies uh, in, uh, in India. And the second thing is uh, the uh, temperance movement and the prohibition in um, the USA between uh, 1920 and 1933. So the legal ban on selling and consumption of alcohol. Of course, alcohol... Um, Overconsumption leads to many social problems and personal tragedies and throughout the 19th century there were temperance movements uh, developing. Here we, have a, uh, here we have a poster of one of these, uh, these movements. Drinking leads to neglect of duty, moral degradation in, and crime. Yes, it is true in many cases, but should it mean 
that the consumption, selling and uh, production of alcohol should be against the law. This was a, an experiment uh, in, uh, in America and uh, if you know anything about American history of this period, this led to even more problems because people continued to drink in secret and organized crime. The gangs uh, who imported alcohol, who produced alcohol, who sold alcohol, uh, grew immensely, creating even more problems. So in the end, the prohibition was lifted. Uh, just as with food, we can also have the moral problems that are still valid concerning, of course, um, just as with clothes, concerning the food. So here we have three, uh, three very modern issues and uh, um, images. For example, uh, should everybody go vegan? Here we have this uh, uh, very nice uh, picture, love, peace, vegan. Is it moral to eat food? Is it moral? Does it really... Um, should it be done in, uh, in the modern world? for moral reasons. So, is uh, the suffering of animals, of farm animals, uh, that are killed for meat um, understandable and uh, should it be excused in modern culture? The next thing is uh, wasting food. How much food are you wasting? And in the modern Western culture, a lot of food is wasted, while at the same time, there are regions in the world with um, uh, people starving. So the distribution of food rather than the consumption of food, where you have some people um, eating too much and wasting food, throwing food away, and some people being malnourished and even dying from starvation. Also, uh, the ecology of food production like uh, here, it is estimated that 6 to 12 orangutans are killed each day for palm oil. So certain products that are especially popular in the modern globalized society, such as palm oil, cause immense degradation of the natural environment and the loss of wildlife. Is it moral? Should be something be done about that? So uh, we still have very important burning issues of, um, I would say, moral relevance uh, concerning food. So that's the end of the three weeks introduction to the study of uh, material culture. And uh, next week we will start something new. We'll start talking about um, the body in culture and also family relations and uh, parenthood as expressed and as um, worked out by the culture. Thank you.